We know that climate change has happened and is happening. And we know why it has happened and is happening. The sixth assessment report of the IPCC reports that global average surface temperature has increased, that September Arctic sea ice area has decreased, that global average sea level has increased, and that global ocean surface pH has decreased. These are all indicators of global climate change. The sixth assessment report further reports that climate change is already affecting every inhabited region across the planet with human influence contributing to many observed changes in weather and climate extremes. This figure shows the assessment of observed change in hot extremes and the confidence in human contribution to the observed changes in the world's regions. This assessment is mainly based on changes in metrics based on daily maximum temperatures. The hexagons represent different world regions. The colours represent the outcome of the assessment. The red colour indicates that there is at least medium confidence. The confidence level for human influence on these observed changes is based on assessing trend detection and attribution and is indicated by the number of dots. Three dots represents high confidence, two dots represents medium confidence and one dot represents low confidence. Note that in the SEA region for Southeast Asia, there has been an increase in hot extremes and there is a high confidence that this increase is due to human influence. This figure shows the assessment of observed change in heavy precipitation and the confidence in human contribution. This assessment is based on changes in indices of one day and five day precipitation amounts. Note again that in Southeast Asia there has been an increase in heavy precipitation, although with low confidence that it is due to human influence. This figure shows the assessment of observed change in agricultural and ecological drought. This assessment is based on the observed and simulated changes in total column soil moisture. Currently, there is low agreement in the type of change that is happening in Southeast Asia. Okay, but what do climate models project for the future? Before looking at projections, you will have noticed that terminology has been introduced for the level of confidence in the assessment of the IPCC in their reports. This level of confidence is based on a combination of the level of agreement and the quality of evidence. A low degree of confidence translates to a 20% chance of being correct, a medium degree of confidence to a 50% chance, and a high degree of confidence to an 80% chance of being correct. When we look at projections, the IPCC will describe the likelihood of the results discussed using this scale. A likely occurrence has a 66% chance of happening, for example. And a very likely occurrence has a 90% chance of happening. Back to the projections then. What are they? The IPCC in their sixth assessment report focused on five illustrative scenarios SSP 5 8.5, SSP 3 7.0, SSP 2 4.5, SSP 1 2.6 and SSP 1 1.9. The simulations begin to be forced by these scenarios in 2015. The scenarios with high and very high greenhouse gas emissions, that is SSP3 7.9 and SSP5 8.5, have CO2 emissions that roughly double from current levels by 2100 and 2050 respectively. The scenario with intermediate greenhouse gas emissions, SSP2 4.5, has emissions that stay around current levels until the middle of the century. The scenarios with very low and low greenhouse gas emissions, SSP1 1.9 and SSP1 2.6, have emissions that decline to net zero around or after 2050, followed by varying levels of net negative CO2 emissions. OK, what did these scenarios predict for temperature? 
This figure shows the temperature change relative to the 1850 to 1900 baseline. The very likely ranges are shown for the SSP1 2.6 and SSP3 7.9 scenarios. Compared to 1850-1900, global surface temperature averaged over 2081 to 2100 is very likely to be higher by 1.0 degrees Celsius to 1.8 degrees Celsius under the very low greenhouse gas emission scenario, that is SSP1 1.9 by 2.1 degrees Celsius to 3.5 degrees Celsius in the intermediate scenario, that is SSP2 4.5, and by 3.3 degrees Celsius to 5.7 degrees Celsius under the very high greenhouse gas emission scenario, that is SSP5 8.5. The last time global surface temperature was sustained at or above 2.5 degrees Celsius higher than the 1850 to 1900 was over 3 million years ago. The simulations indicate that global surface temperature will continue to increase until at least the mid-century under all emission scenarios considered. Global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius will be exceeded during the 21st century unless deep reductions in CO2 and other greenhouse gases emissions occur in the coming decades. While Earth's average global temperature is rising, the amount of warming is not equal in all areas of the world. This visualization shows how temperature changes will be distributed across the globe for four out of the five scenarios discussed. The simulations shown here are from the Iris Center for High-End Computing. Note that the baseline period is different. The baseline here is 1981 to 2010. As the simulations progress, you can see that the oceans warm more slowly than land because it takes much more heat to warm water than land. In general, the middle of continents are expected to warm more than coastal areas. Regional topography, such as mountain ranges, will influence this too. At high latitudes, especially in and near the Arctic, temperatures are warming faster than places closer to the equator. The Arctic is heating up about twice as quickly as the global average. Singapore is projected to see between 1 degree Celsius to 2 degree Celsius increase in temperature for the low greenhouse gas emission scenario, to between 4 degree Celsius to 5 degree Celsius increase in temperature for the very high greenhouse gas emission scenario. Next, let's look at precipitation. This Second visualization shows annual precipitation change from simulations by the same group as before. Although global average precipitation increases by between 3% to about 10%, this additional precipitation is not distributed evenly around the globe. Much of the increase in precipitation is expected to occur at high latitudes. Increased snowfall near both poles may offset some of the melting of glaciers and ice sheets in these regions by adding fresh ice to the top of these features. Some places in Antarctica are even gaining more snow via increased precipitation than they are losing to melting caused by rising temperatures. Some of the increased rainfall is expected to come in the form of more frequent heavy downpours. Some regions may receive a net increase in rainfall, but the increase may manifest itself as heavier rains punctuated by longer dry spells between these deluges. This change in precipitation patterns is likely to cause a greater incidence of flooding, especially in combination with land use changes such as deforestation. However, many regions near the equator and at mid-latitudes are expected to see decreases in precipitation. Many areas, especially in low and mid-latitude regions, are expected to suffer from more frequent and more severe droughts. Dry conditions, warmer temperatures that produce longer fire seasons, and changes in ecosystems are expected to generate more and larger wildfires in some areas. Some presently dry regions may be glad to see increased rainfall, just as drier conditions may benefit some currently very wet places. However, heavy rainfall that causes flooding, as well as its extended or more frequent droughts, are likely to be disrupted to ecosystems and agriculture in the afflicted regions. 
This next figure shows September Arctic sea ice area. The trends of the last few decades are expected to continue. The Arctic is projected to be practically ice-free near mid-century under intermediate and high greenhouse gas emission scenarios. This figure shows the projected changes in global ocean surface pH. The acidification due to the absorption of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is expected to continue. Note that decreasing pH indicates acidification. Since the Industrial Revolution, the pH has dropped by 0.1 units. This might not sound like much, but the pH scale is logarithmic, so this change represents approximately a 30% increase in acidity. The low greenhouse gas emission scenarios do project a recovery of pH before the end of the century, but the intermediate and high greenhouse gas emission scenarios all project continued decline. This will further impact many ocean species like oysters and corals that make hard shells and skeletons by combining calcium and carbonate from seawater. If the pH gets too low, shells and skeletons can even begin to dissolve. What about sea level? This figure shows global average sea level change relative to 1900. It is virtually certain that sea level will continue to rise over the 21st century. By the end of the century, it is likely that sea level will rise by between 0.48 and 0.78 metres under the low greenhouse gas emission scenario and by between 0.79 to 1.17 metres under the very high greenhouse gas emission scenario. Global average sea level rise above the likely range, approaching 2 metres in the very high emission scenario, cannot be ruled out due to the deep uncertainty in ice sheet processes. In the longer term, sea level is committed to rise for centuries to millennia, due to continuing deep ocean warming and ice sheet melt, and will remain elevated for thousands of years. This figure shows the projected rise in sea level by 2300 in the low and very high greenhouse gas emission scenarios. Sea level rise greater than 15 metres cannot be ruled out in the very high emission scenario. Qualitatively, the trends seen in climate changes to date are set to continue. There is a great deal of variability in how climate change will evolve in the next century that is highly dependent on which of the scenarios we end up following. It is painfully clear that action to mitigate climate change is urgently needed. Thanks for listening.